This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Uh, welcome to Grilled by the Staff Canteen and thanks for listening. If you are a regular listener, feel free to mention us to your mates or colleagues um, if you think you would enjoy it. So uh, virtually kind of pass on the pod, if you will. That would be great. So I'm Cara, editor of the Staff Canteen. Um, in this episode, I wanted to talk about opening a new venture during COVID-19. So with a lot of restaurants, pubs, bars, either still not able to open or sadly making the, de- the decision to close uh, permanently, Um, It seems a little bit of a terrifying prospect to start from scratch. So I found two chefs who are taking on that challenge. Um, Craig Treadwells, who's a former head chef at Man Behind the Curtain in Leeds, and Kellen Tiggle, who was the head chef at the Forest Side. So thank you both for joining me today. Craig, let's start with you. So your restaurant, um, 670 Grams, is opening on Wednesday. So squeaky bomb time for you in Birmingham. Um, So... Talk to me about that. Why did you want to take on a new business now? Well, I didn't really. I'd already signed the lease before someone at a bat, so okay. um, I had to. Uh, that's, that's the reality of it. Uh, so yeah, but obviously it's um, it's it, it's just made everything obviously a bit longer. Mm-hmm. But when is there a good time to open a restaurant? Really. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. If, any, if anything, it's not, it's, it's not, I know it's bad because people are losing their jobs and stuff like that, but people are eating out, do you know what I mean? People, and people do want to go to go to new places and, and are getting excited for stuff like that. So, I don't know, I think, I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Obviously, it's my first one, so it, I don't know what, what, how it would be different to if it wasn't due to yeah. COVID-19. So, I, I don't really have an answer to, to it apart from I already signed the lease bank already gave me the money and I had to open it yeah yeah so, okay so yeah so with that in mind then what what were your thoughts having already got the lease and the money and then coronavirus happened what did you think uh I, I, I thought it was it was good, good time to um spend with my daughter <laughs> yeah and uh, <laughs> and really but better time that I've got no excuses now when this opens. So if there's any mistakes or anything missed, uh, I've had more than enough time to get it ready. So basically, it, it, I'm not going to say it's benefited me because it hasn't. But I'm not like I'm not like a normal restaurant where where I had to pay staff bills, like even like sort out of the furlough and stuff like that. It was nothing. It's, this is like starting from scratch on Wednesday. So yeah. I haven't lost anything yet. I haven't lost any money which obviously a lot of people have. So for me, it's just, and, you know, we're, we're booked up to the end of October, which is great. So thank you to everyone for that. We're only a small, we're only a small restaurant, 16 covers. Um, so, you know, we're not, we're not a hundred seat a restaurant or we've turned tables or anything like that. So to be fair, I think I've been very lucky that this was my plan before COVID, but it's going to benefit me during COVID. So I, yeah. think, I think looks a big thing for it for me in it really. Okay, and it's, obviously it's interesting you said that because Kevin, we talked just before we came onto this, and you said that you yeah. had been looking at somewhere <laughs> else, and you felt like it was yeah. lucky that actually you hadn't signed for that particular property. Yeah, we we were very lucky. I mean, I, me and Nicola, my wife, have been looking for somewhere for quite a while now, and a couple of places cropped down, uh, cropped up pre-lockdown. And we were very interested in one in particular, and obviously COVID came in, but we were still in the position where we could pull out of that particular deal at that time. And in all honesty, I think that was a good decision to do that because it left open the opportunity to get the place we've got now. Um, I, com- I completely agree with what Chris said before. I mean, when is it a good time to open a restaurant? It never is. It's always squeaky bum time. But I think having that period over lockdown to yourselves and you can sort of bounce a few ideas off each other, you can start to get a plan together, really, and you, yeah. you just need a bit more time to make the initial mistakes that could have quite possibly happened if you'd have just gone straight in for it. Yeah. 
And so tell, yeah. t- 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 uh, whilst we're with you, Kevin, t- tell us about um, the uh, inn that you've taken on in the lakes and, and why that obviously is now, you're glad that that's the property that you've now got instead of the one that you were looking at before. Well, we took, we took, we took on a, it's a 17th century coaching inn. Um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful little building. It needs a lot of work doing to it. But it, it's got the character we were after. Um, the beauty of it being a bit of a doer up is put 100% of our influence into it right from the start rather than taking on a going concern and having to run it in a bit before we feel comfortable making changes. It's um, it's in a lovely spot as well. I mean, I don't think there's been a day gone by since we got the keys that the locals haven't been in to sort of offer the help or support. So, you know, it's, I just feel this we've picked the right spot in the right area and I think no matter which way it goes for us because nobody knows yet, I think we'll have the support, full support of the locals and businesses around the area. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, both of you, uh, you couldn't have two more different locations, could you really? So obviously you're, Cray, are you sit, city centre? Yeah, so just outside the city centre, it's a little place called uh, Big Buff. It's, it's almost a little bit like Hackney Car- Cara. Okay, Cara. okay. You're very familiar with your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's that sort of vibe. So it's a lot of skate shops and uh, little coffee shops and a lot of uh, street art and stuff like that. So it's not quite in Birmingham. It's literally just outside as you'd come into Birmingham. Uh, it's a lot, lot cheaper in Birmingham, to be honest. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, Kevin, where, where describe where you are, because obviously in, in the lakes, I'm, I'm imagining very much in the rolling countryside, right? We're at, we're at a place called uh, Newton in Cartmel, so it's, it's just at the top of the Cartmel Valley. Okay. Um, it's got an all right view. It's a beautiful little village. Um, it's got good access from one of the main roads. So it's, it's not in the heart of the Lake District, it's, it's on the edge. Yeah, yeah, okay. But, and so what are your, both of your uh, biggest concerns then with, Craig, you're just about to open. So you're obviously in a, a different spot to where Kevin is. You're just, you know, you're just about to start with all of yeah. that kind of journey of, uh, you know, refurbing and everything like that. So, Craig, what are your like biggest concerns for, for opening Wednesday? I know you said you're booked up till October. So that's obviously one of those things kind of off the list. But yeah, what else think, do you worry about? I think what I'm most worried about is... Um, everyone's sticking to the guidelines because I feel like, you know, as a restaurant, you can do so much, but also the customer has a responsibility as well. And it can't just be down to the restaurant. It's like, I don't know if you've been coughing all morning, only you do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you're coming, you know, with the guidelines now, it's only four to a household and you put the table of six and you're from a different household. How, why is that my responsibility to okay. say to you that, that, you know, you, you, you can't come in. Why do I lose a table of six? Because you didn't follow the rules. So now, now I don't benefit from it. So I think that I think it's getting that point across to people that, you know, we're, we're, we are genuinely all in it together. You can't just blame the restaurant. You know, we can do as much as we can. Like I've had to take tables out of the restaurant because um, I wanted everyone to have a seat and that was your seat for the night. And now obviously okay. I, can't, I can't do that. So... You know, I need to, you know, it's a little bit more pressure on me and the team to like, you know, get them tables out and ready so there's space for the next people. But if they don't, if they don't commit to them guidelines as well, then what, why would, why do I have to do it? Do you know what I mean? I think yeah. that's, that's what I'm more worried about is having to have conversations with people that I don't really want to have in a sense of like, you need to respect the rules too. Yeah. Especially when there's drink involved and stuff like that, so... Yeah, yeah. And then um, do you feel like, do both of you feel quite fortunate that actually you ha- you are starting from scratch so you could kind of, you can fit out the restaurant as it needs to be for those rules to, to, to apply? Is that is that kind of a positive that you're not having to go in and change your restaurant from what it was before? I, I think that's a massive benefit. I mean, Cray and myself, uh, we're, in, we're in a great position where we can start however we want to do with as many staff so we can make the environment in the kitchen or restaurant safer for our staff with minimal staff we're in that position where we've not had to necessarily let anyone go we we haven't had to cut our tables down to make way for social distancing we can start with the amount that we need to do to make it a safe environment and 
for us, you know, we, we don't know, our businesses won't know any different until we're allowed to expand that and put a few more people in. So, you know, we're, we're in a position where we can prepare for that right from the off instead of having to make cuts and things. Yeah. I think yeah. It's, you know, it's good for us. Yeah. And what about you, Craig? Is that, was that an advantage to you? Obviously, I've seen like how you've changed the restaurants been changing over the course of time where you've been doing your artwork and everything like that. But in terms of, yeah. you know, you've been able to do it exactly how you need to do it to apply, apply those rules. Yeah, I think that thing again, we've, you know, we, we've obviously had more time than a lot of restaurants that, you know, that had to shut and needed to open straight away. And uh, basically, I'm fortunate enough that I let them restaurants open first so I could learn from their mistakes. So I could have opened at the start of July, whenever it was, but I thought I'll wait, see what happens with them, see how they do it and copy them. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it is a positive to talk to both of you, though, because I have spent, a, you know, a fair few months talking to chefs who, you know, they can't open or and it's either a permanent thing or just at the minute they just physically can't accommodate people and accommodate the new rules. So I think it's good to talk to you both on, on a positive, right? It's good for the industry to see that people are able to open viable businesses, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's, so for you as well, seeing that, because you're opening, Kevin, obviously talking to someone who's opening, is that made you, does it make you feel a bit more confident going forward? It does, yeah. I mean... Listening to what Chris had to say today so far, it's, it kind of confirms what we're thinking. I mean, we're in the same boat and, you know, there are, there are obvious worries about, I mean, especially up here, it's, it is quite a seasonal district in terms of catering. We have a good summer, we're busy, but then it tends to die off. So we, we do kind of rely on our summer trade to see us through those months. But whether it's an initial spike because everyone's just been let loose again, uh, everyone's busy. Everyone's absolutely packed up here to their to their capacities. That is, I mean, I've not spoke to anyone who isn't full at the moment and taking bookings for those periods where we're generally quiet. How long that goes on for and and whatnot, I'm not so sure. That's that's what we need to kind of work on. Like we need if if it dies off to a point where it's not really profitable we're going to have to think on our feet and adapt. I think that's the main thing through this period is adapting yeah. to what we're dealing with. I think, I think that's um, where we are lucky again, though, because when you do start a business, you never, you never think it's going to go full hammer at the start. So you already cater for that in your head. We've already, obviously, doing our business plans and stuff like that, in our head, we was never full. So, you know, these restaurants that are opening back up now, we need to be full because they've lost a lot of money and a lot of, you know, a lot of rent and a lot of time, whereas, you know, it, it hasn't really changed for us in a sense. Um, if it's slow at the start, it was probably always going to be slow at the start, whether it was COVID or not, because we're new businesses. If, do you know what I mean? So we, we, we still have that time to build it up, whereas these businesses that was busy, that was doing 100 people and now can only do 30, 35 people, that's who it's hit the most. You know, that, that's who I feel sorry for, really. Mm. Yeah. Um, and do either of you worry about um, a, a second lockdown, not necessarily across the board, but in your kind of areas? Do you, do you worry about that at all going forward? I think at the minute, I don't, I, I, ain't got, I ain't got time to worry about it. If it happens, it happens. It <laughs> yeah. happens for everyone, doesn't it? Again, it's, again if, if we shut tomorrow, then the restaurants that have already been shut are worse off. So again, it, it, it's just, it's luck. You know, obviously I don't want to shut, I want to open and I haven't earned any money for like four, four months and, and we need to start taking some money but you can only do what you can do, can't you? So that's just, that, that's just life, isn't it? It's, again, it won't affect us as much as it would them, them other restaurants that have reopened and had to re-shut. Yeah. So, yeah. What, about, what about you, Kevin? You said that you do worry about that, right? Absolutely. I mean... You'd be daft not to worry about it. If if we did go into a second lockdown, it would put into it would put us back into the situation that we luckily managed to avoid in the first place. But I mean, risks need to be taken if you want to be a successful business. And Agreed. everything else seems to have slotted into place for us. But there are, of course, there are worries. 
Um, I think if if we do go back into lockdown, we're all in it together. It's not just mine and Craig's restaurants. It's you know we're all in it together, and we'll just have to push on and adapt and find something to get through it. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we've talked about obviously. Um, the, your thoughts on kind of opening during COVID and stuff like that. But tell me about your new places. Let's talk a bit more about, about those. So, so Craig, what is your new place? Like what can people <clears throat> expect um, from coming to dine with you? Uh, I think my restaurant is probably for, uh, oh, I don't want to sound rude actually. It's more aimed at a younger generation of people that don't have that, would like to go to these restaurants but don't have 400, 500 pounds to spend on a meal. Okay. So, you know, it's the, it's the middle ground where, you know, uh, we play hip hop music, we, we do food that we want to do and it's, it's, a, it's at a price that, you know, any, anyone can come really uh, for that experience rather, rather than it being subjected. So people, people say, oh, why don't we have a lot of chefs anymore in industry or any front of house? How do you expect these people to get into the industry if they can't afford to go out and eat in the places that you want them to work? How do they get a feel for it? And I think that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bridge the gap that way. And, you know, I remember when I was 17 and I went to the Fat Duck and uh, I drank water and um, I had to walk back to the train station because I didn't have any money left. <laughs> and and that, that tarnished my experience because, now, because I didn't... I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have. So then I thought, oh, it weren't worth it that. But it obviously was. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't afford it at the time. I'm not comparing myself to the fact that, by the way, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> saying that, um, you know, I think there's not a, lot of, not a lot of restaurants, especially tasting menu-wise or fine dining, that are at a reasonable price. Obviously, they are for them because their, their rent's higher, their staff's higher, their everything's higher. But I'm trying to bridge that gap where, you know, if you're 21 years old and you want to take your girlfriend out, it's not going to cost you, it's not going to cost you a holiday, basically. Yeah, yeah. that's a really interesting point, actually. That's a really interesting point. I'd never thought about when you're a young chef wanting to go out to eat and, like you said, having to sit and drink water because part of the experience is that you, you feel like you can do everything, isn't it? So, yeah, exactly, yeah. You want the full experience, don't you? you yeah. Don't hard. Yeah. What do you think, Kevin? I think that's a really interesting point. I think, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. I mean, it's affordability, isn't it, really? I mean, yeah. let's be honest, who goes out every week to eat at somewhere expensive, no matter what the quality? Yeah. We certainly don't, especially with two kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we look at, we're lucky if we get to Pizza Express. <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing wrong with Pizza Express, by the way. Absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, so what's the food like then, um, Craig, before we come on to you, Kevin, what's the, you know, you talked about the experience and what you're trying to do. What, what sort yeah. of, what's the food style? Sorry to put so, you in a pigeonhole. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. So the, it's the same with that, really. It's like, you know, um, it's, it's food that, it's indulgent food that you want to eat rather than, you know, you know, it's made, it's not, there's no, not really any vegetables or anything like that. You know, we don't celebrate the onion. We've got nine elements of an onion on a dish, right. or asparagus. What asparagus that tastes like piss that we cook like six different ways. It's just more of um, you know, food that you take away, food that you'd want to eat, refined. So when you come and eat here, you go, oh, I'd love to have that again, rather than, uh, that was interesting. Okay, so I, feel like you, I feel like you're being tainted tasted. by uh, by onions and asparagus. Yeah. No, but less <laughs> <laughs> Less interesting and more tasty. Okay. <laughs> Give me an example Spot dish for, for when you open it on Wednesday. Uh, so stem ginger uh, cake with jasmine rice custard, plums cooked in sake, and plums cooked in sake and soy. And yeah, that's it. That's okay. the pre dessert. Okay. So like yeah, lots of then, interesting flavours going on there. And then we have a little tea and toast macaroon. That is basically when you have a baby. After you have a baby, you um, they give you tea and toast, don't they? Mm -hmm. So it's based around that, which is quite okay. cool. So that's the la that's the last thing you get here because okay. it was the last thing I got before I had a daughter. Okay. So yeah. 
Uh, you're not giving people that because the experience is so intense that they need tea and toast to get over it, are you? Uh, <laughs> That's usually why they do it for women. <laughs> no, basically, I want it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I want it. I want people to leave here and think I just want to go clubbing now. Okay. Well, That's what yeah. I want. Yeah. Fine. Exactly. But so, I mean, it sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, well, we know what you're like, Cara. <laughs> so, Kevin, I bet you're going to tell me now that yours is a completely different concept. So, tell me about um, what you've got planned for what you're doing um, and what people can expect when they come to you. Oh, loads of onions. <laughs> what, what we want to do is, there's a niche for the, in the market in Cumbria for somewhere that kind of bridges the gap between your traditional country house hotel and a pub. So we're going to do it all a little bit, not, yeah. So what, what we want from our venture is, we want a solid pub that sells good ales, decent little snacky bits of food, somewhere all the locals can come in, not spend a lot, you know, get a few plates of whatever. If they want more, they can order more, etc. And just have a good pint or a good glass of wine or whatnot. But we've got two rooms and in the back room, we're going to do the food that I'm a bit more renowned for. Like, you know what I mean? The posh stuff. The posh stuff. Um, <laughs> but what we want to achieve in that building is we want the people that are going up into that restaurant to go up there, do what they're doing, have a lovely time, hopefully, and then come down to the pub and have a crack with Steve from the village. We right. want to kind of build that gap yeah. between high hills and walking boots. Yeah, yeah. That's and nice. it's, important, it's important to keep the, the locals on side as well, though, isn't it, in, in a place like yeah, that? Yeah, well, that's it. It comes back to the point that Chris said before. Do you want to go to the fat duck and drink a glass of water? Or do you want to come and have a great pint, have whatever you want to eat, you know, no holes barred on the pub side of things, and then get you, you get. We want people to experience both sides while they're in the building, because you're not you're not going to get as much repeat custom in the posh bit, are you? Yeah. Like you're not going to come back every week, but we want people to see that from the pub and go, oh, I wouldn't mind eating up there. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. realise, we'll see the menus and realise that we're not ripping them off. This is we're going to do it at a very fair price, and we want people up in the posh bit to look down into the restaurant, in into the pub, and go, you know what? I don't want to sit in the lounge enough petty fours. I want to go down there and have a good beer. Yeah, and that's that's what we want. Yeah. Okay. Okay. A good a good mix. I think that's good that everyone there's a choice. Then isn't there? You can do either. Yeah. Or so yeah. Um. Tell me about the highs and lows of uh, taking on your own place so far, and and why d- why did you uh, decide that this is the time for you? You know, I'm, I'm ready now to do this on my own because it's it's a big step, isn't it, to coming out away from uh, a, an, an established restaurant and going on, out on your own. So so far, Kevin, what are the the highs and the lows of uh, taking on your own place? The highs and the, we're not that far down into our project yet, so the highs are actually getting the keys, having that yeah. exciting feeling at the start that you get to have to yourselves and be like, yeah, we're going to make this work together, having a glass of wine and just being like, yeah, what, and then putting your focus into how are we going to make this work. They're, they're the highs for us now. We're, we're, we're working really well as a team, bouncing some really good ideas off. The lows are, for us, of doing a do up there, is you've got to get your hands dirty. Yeah. <laughs> so the build of that in yet, yeah, we're sort of getting, we're at that point where we're doing as much work as we can in order to prepare for them to come in and do the bits we can't do. Um, that's the lows for us. Yeah. But like yeah. you said, you are at the start. So maybe when I ask you in a year's time, there might be, <laughs> there might be a slightly different answer. Yeah. <laughs> Craig, what about you? What's the highs and lows so far of having your own place? I think the lows are uh, not sleeping very well, to be honest. Just because okay. when you're a chef, yeah, all you have to think about is like cooking food. But then when you have your own restaurant, you have to think about how the PDQ machine works, like where where to get bins. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. I didn't know where to get bins from. Someone else used to do that. That was a ball out. <laughs> so yeah, just the bits that the bits that you don't like to do, basically. But then the highs weigh out all of that because I can do whatever I want to do from now on if this works so 
the restaurant, I've picked the interior, I've picked the kitchen, I've picked the plates, I've picked the wine, I've picked the food. So basically, I ain't got someone telling me, you can't do that, cook that white asparagus. Um, I'm joking about the white asparagus, but uh, yeah, exactly. So basically, I've got a freedom now yeah. to, be, to, to, to not work for anyone else, not have to do what they want me to do, or <coughs> yeah, it, it's 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 all up to me, and I think that's that's a good position. I want this. I want this. Like, I pick. I know I shouldn't pick all the wines and stuff like that because I'm not a sommelier and stuff like that. But I have picked all the wines because I want it to be here because we're so small. It's literally like you come into my house for dinner. So that's the wine that I've got in today. So all the the menu and the wine menu are all handwritten every day. So nothing goes stale. So if I'm sick of seeing the the mackerel dish, I just don't do it that day, and I write something else, and I go to the market, and I do something else on that day. And it's the same with the wine. If no if that if no one's liking that wine, it gets changed the next day, and it's it's almost like you know if you come to mine for dinner, Cara, and that's the wine that I've got in the fridge, and that's the food I've got in the fridge, and that's what you're having. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. I like that. And um, I wanted to talk quickly as well about um, recruitment. So, um, how uh, do you? I mean, Cray, I don't know how many people you've got what that you've got working for you, and how easy that was to do. And, and Kevin, I don't know. I know obviously you're working with your wife, but you'll have a, a, a number in mind of the team that you need to do that. So, during everything, obviously with the current climate and everything that's going on, have you found recruitment? okay is it something you've thought about yet kevin um i don't know so we've put a bit we've put a bit of thought into it i mean as i said earlier we can start small and then expand as it's safe to do so so i i have got people in the pipeline that yeah. i know that yeah they'll they'll be there when the time comes but in terms of numbers actual numbers we've not really thought that through 100 percent yet because yeah we don't know what it's going to be doing next month so i've got a, i've got a rough idea of our staff sizes but a bit okay. reluctant to start recruiting just yet okay but you think you'd, you'll be fine recruiting i think i think so i think i think so it's i mean we're, we're certainly looking at having a smaller team than i used to have at the last yeah. few places that i worked at yeah so okay. yeah and Craig, how have you found it? How have you found recruiting? I think recruiting's been pretty straightforward, really. I think you know a lot of people have, have needed a job, haven't they? So yeah. it's, uh, it, it's with, with recruitment, it's difficult. There's a lot of people apply for the job, but it's getting the right person to fit your restaurant, isn't it? And um, you know, people asking for stupid amounts of money when we're in the middle of a pandemic, like more money than I'm gonna get. And it, <laughs> I mean, that sometimes is a bit like. But I've got a, I've got the perfect team that I want right now. We're all young, fresh, hungry, all in the same, all in the same direction. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy with that. And yeah, I'm great, great, okay. all good. For me. Well, Thank that's you. good. That's good to hear. So, um, finally, uh, thoughts on the kind of recovery of the hospitality industry and the future Ooh. of of restaurants. What does that look like for you too? Because I've I've spoke to a, a few different chefs. Some people you know they're seeing like fine dining they're like maybe that's not what people want not high-end fine dining people don't want to do that anymore and we've seen places like i don't know like the ledbury closing because they just they can't they're not viable at, at the minute maybe they might be again in a year two years yeah. time but um what are both your thoughts on, on the industry are you confident that it's gonna that it's gonna come back um or is it gonna be just a completely different uh, look uh, as we come out of this pandemic well i, I Personally, I think, you know, it's, it is back, isn't it? Like, you know, in, everyone I speak to, like, Pernell's is full every night. Okay. And it's, do you know what I mean? It's basically what I think will happen, well, they're not full because they used to do 100 covers and now they're only doing 35. But what I'm saying is that that, that will benefit everyone. And this, this is my point that I said on a staff canteen interview before. I didn't say... You know, if, if people did less covers, it would be better. What I'm saying is, everyone has to do less now. So where maybe Salt was doing uh, 12 on a Tuesday night, because Penance was doing 100, now it all evens itself out. There's, there's money in the pot for everyone. So now Penance is only doing 35. Where's that other 70 people going to go and eat? They're going to go somewhere, because they're not just going to stay in. So maybe now Salt does 24 on a Tuesday night when they used to do 12. So, you know, you know, it's... It, 
it should be. Hopefully, I'm, I might be wrong, but what I'm trying to say is, is that the people that used to do a lot of covers can't do as many, but then people have still got to go and eat. So the smaller restaurants that maybe on a Tuesday will probably do 12, hopefully now we'll do, we'll do 24 instead or, or 20, okay. and it will work out like that. I think everyone has to help each other out. And I think if you can do less covers and it's feasible for you, then you should do it because we're all in it together and, and you know, it helps the next person out. I think there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of greed in restaurants the last few years and everyone's got comfortable. Where the, What I meant was, is if, if, if I do eight covers uh, tomorrow night, them eight people will have a better experience than me doing 16. And that's just logic. That's not, that's not me. Everyone says, oh, everyone will have the same experience. Well, it doesn't always work like that because on a Saturday night, you're in the shit more than you are on a Tuesday. And that's just life in any restaurant. And you can say, oh, everyone gets the same experience. They don't. It's, ne it's never ever worked like that. If you go and eat in a restaurant and they do eight covers and they're supposed to do 16, you will have a better time as a customer. Fact. Okay. So you're seeing, you're, I mean, you're very positive about it then, which is like really good to hear, like that you very like positive about the industry recovering and, and all the rest of it. So, um, Kevin, are you, are you the same? Do, how are you think feeling about the future of restaurants and the industry? I'm, 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 I mean, we always find a way to balance back. You know, we had a rough do with foot and mouth here a while back. I think it was about 2001. It basically put the industry on its ass. But you get through these things. And as it says, we're all in it together. We're, you know, we're all yeah. in the same boat. We need to find that what we need to do is adapt yeah. and go with the changes. I mean, we, we're lucky, right? We have the safety net of the location. I mean, we're always going to get tourism in this area and it's got yeah. nothing to do with food scene. It's, it's to do with the area. So there's always going to be that market of people to aim at. And I mean, if our mine and Nicholas plans go tits up and we find out that the fine dining side of things isn't working, the combination isn't working, then as business owners, we're in complete power to change that, to hit the market. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Same as me, Cara. If no one wants to eat fine dining food, I'm more than happy to do mutton and rice. Yeah. I'm, re I'm really good at it. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you've got a backup plan, Craig. <laughs> that turtle cry. <laughs> Oh, well, that's fantastic. Okay, brilliant. Well, um, I think that's a perfect place uh, to end it. And like you said, I think positive thoughts is great. And the fact that the industry and people in it are always willing to adapt, I think is a, definitely a good thing. And I think everything, hopefully everything will be fine. So, and, ho and no more lockdowns. We don't want any more of those. So, no, no, no. <laughs> brilliant. I don't, okay. think, I don't think we will have a, a second lockdown anyway. Well, I'm well, hoping not one across the board. If we all think like that, then it won't happen, will it? energy Cara. positive energy okay yeah <laughs> brilliant all right well thank you both so much and um craig good luck uh opening on wednesday kevin um when are you actually opening kevin or do you have do you not have a definite date in mind we're looking towards the end of autumn but we haven't got a specific date in mind okay okay well good luck with that as well and i'm sure i'll talk to you again once you're once you're uh, yeah. both open and uh, have a little bit more idea of the lay of the land. So, um, yeah, well, thank, thank you. you uh, thank you, and you. Nice to meet you and talk yeah. to you. Thank nice you. to meet you, mate. All right. you Thanks too. very I'll much. Come see you. In your I'm sure we'll bump into each other at some point, hopefully. Yeah, I'm sure we will, yeah. No problem, Unless mate. Unless up and you just serve mutton and I end up winning a pub. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. You do the beer, mate. I'll do the mutton. <laughs> Sounds right. like a plan. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this interview, and if you have any comments feel free to tweet us or comment on the post uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download and finally if you like what we do whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features please head over to our patreon page and support us there this episode of grilled is sponsored by rationale your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment register now for a free rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com